Hello everyone, welcome to session three of LTech 620 Visual Design. This week, the pendulum swings. And what I mean by that is we've been focusing quite a bit on the left side of our Venn diagram, focusing in on the elements and principles of visual design. In this video, I'm going to swing the pendulum a bit to the right so that we talk a little bit more about visual literacy and how it relates to visual design within the context of education or teaching and learning. Now, before we get into all of that, I do want to talk a little bit about the five lines assignments. Now, one of the things we haven't really talked about this semester is this idea that there are elements of design. Now, depending on which source you cite, there are anywhere from six, seven, sometimes eight different elements of design. And as you can see here, I have one example where there's point, line, shape, space, form, value, and color. And the idea behind the elements of design is that these can be used together or separately to create all kinds of visual representations. In the past, these design elements have been compared to the notes that a musician uses to write a song or the words that a poet uses to write a poem. These are the elements that a visual designer uses to create visual representations. Now, I wanted to talk about that because the five lines assignment, of course, focused in on one of these elements of design and that is or was the line element. And of course, by relying solely on lines, you also had to confront other elements of design, such as shape, space, form, and so on. And so the purpose of the assignment was multifaceted. I wanted you to learn to see lines from different perspectives, to learn about structure and composition, and of course, to practice transforming vector graphics in Affinity Designer, and to practice is designing with intention. And so I gave you lots of constraints. Everything had to be black and white. The lines had to be a certain width. You had to use a certain number of lines and you had to design with intention to communicate a certain message such as loud or quiet. Now let's take a minute to look at some of your designs. So here we can see the 10 pixel quiet designs. And here we have the 10 pixel loud designs. Here is the 80 pixel quiet designs. And here we can see the 80 pixel loud designs. Now I wanted to connect this five lines assignment to what we read about in the Johnson article about human perception being biased. And I've highlighted a couple of your designs here to really connect to our inherent biases, but also this is going to be a nice segue into talking about this week's readings with the callow piece and some concepts about visual culture. So the first three designs you see here, Byron's high design, Katie's electrocardiogram graph, and Diana's treasure map, it's almost impossible for us to look at these and not see more than five lines. These first three examples are really pictograms. They're pictorial representations. They're iconic signs which represent some sort of concept or fact through some visual carrier of meaning. So of course an H and I structured like that is immediately going to make us think of the word high. It's very hard to shut off our reading of that. The same goes for the electrocardiogram. I would argue that that is such a common and recognizable display. Interestingly, the same goes for the treasure map. I think almost all of us, even if Diana didn't say that in her loom reflection, I think many of us would probably stumble upon the conclusion that that looks like X marks the spot. Now, I put in this last one. This happens to be Jamie's design on the right because this one one is different from these other three pictograms in that it really is so abstract that it really does come down to us kind of, we have to step back and think about what is the meaning of these lines. 
because it doesn't bring up any semantic understanding. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't immediately bring up some other external context or meaning that we might project onto those five lines. And so I just thought it was interesting to kind of look at these and think about how our past, the present, and our goals as viewers would influence our interpretation of these five lines designs. Okay, now that works as a really nice segue into the concept of visual culture. We read in the Callow article, Callow actually cites Barnard to define visual culture as this kind of enormous variety of visual 2D and 3D dimensional things that human beings produce and consume as part of our cultural and social lives. And so in this particular graph, you're seeing that really since the 1990s, the rise of the phrase visual culture. It's really taking on a meaning beyond visual literacy and visual design. And, and really it's surpassing graphic design in terms of people writing about the concept of visual culture. And I think some of that relates to the advent of technology and that there are so many screens and there's so many ways to create and author and build visual representation that there really has been this uprising of thinking about what is the role of visual culture in our lives. Callow helped us understand that there are various approaches to analyzing and thinking about images and visual culture. And drawing on the work of Barnard, Callow argued that all analytical approaches fall on a continuum. And this continuum is anchored by the structuralist tradition on one end and the hermeneutic tradition on the other. Now, some of you may be unfamiliar with these terms, but don't let that vocabulary throw you off. They're really simple ideas in the end. They're really all about how we know, what we know, and where we derive meaning. Now, on the one hand, we have the structuralist tradition. Analytical approaches from this tradition emphasize the importance of existing systems and patterns. Individual interpretation of, say, a picture doesn't really matter much in this tradition. What does matter, on the other hand, is one's ability to look at a picture and situate it within cultural and social constructs. In other words, an individual's unique perspective and interpretation doesn't matter as much. What does matter is how an artifact represents or fits into a given set of norms. Now, on the other side of the continuum, we have the hermeneutic tradition. And this analytical approach is all about the individual. And the individual's unique interpretation is really what matters. As a viewer, the desires, beliefs, and values that you bring to a visual artifact is of utmost importance and should come first. In short, in this tradition, meaning is the business of individuals as opposed to culture or society. Now, stepping back, the point is that both ways of analyzing visual content are important. We could think about the five lines designs from a structuralist tradition or a hermeneutic tradition. And learners should be able to value their own individual preferences and reactions, as well as apply social and cultural representations to a given visual representation. That's a skill. It's something we want to develop in ourselves and in our students and anyone that we work with. An individual who is visually literate should be able to draw on both traditions while recognizing their relative strengths and weaknesses. At this point, Callow introduces us to his three-dimensional model of image analysis. He argues that if we really want to prepare people to live in a visual society, they're going to need to be able to analyze visual content from three perspectives. The effective, the compositional, and the critical. The effective perspective acknowledges the individual's role. It includes the sensual and immediate response an individual might have when viewing a visual artifact. This dimension also involves aesthetic appreciation and it values creative choices in both the viewing and the creating of images. The second dimension is the compositional one. The compositional dimension emphasizes composition, including semiotic, structural, and contextual elements. This approach understands how elements and signs are put together 
to create meaning. It also considers social situations, cultural contexts, and formal stylistic and artistic elements in order to bring about understanding of a given image. The third and final dimension is the critical dimension. This perspective acknowledges the importance of socio-critical critique. It views all images entirely in the realm of ideology. In other words, it supports socially just and equitable approaches to understanding. For example, the critical perspective might ask, who has the power to create this image? Or who is represented or not represented by a particular image? Stepping back, what Callow is advocating is that we give learners opportunities to engage in all three dimensions of visual analysis. He argues that by engaging with broader concepts of visuality, the possibilities of a more enriching understanding of images becomes apparent. Of course, in LTEC 620, we could practice applying these three dimensions of analysis to all of the visual content we've been analyzing and creating. For example, the visual designs for the drugstore cowboy assignment or the five lines assignment. Callow believes that by switching between these dimensions, we can offer not only multiple perspectives on images at a theoretical level, but also at a pedagogical level where educators might provide multiple pathways into positive learning experiences. Okay, swinging back over to the other side to focus on visual design, we are going to continue with our principles of design. Let's contrast principles of design with our elements of design that we talked about earlier. And we talked about this idea introduced by Williams that good design involves learning the principles of good design, recognizing when they're not being used, and of course, applying those principles. And this past week, we did a great job learning about proximity, alignment, and repetition. And of course, there are other principles shown here that we will be studying in the weeks ahead. Mala Med and her book, Visual Design Solutions, emphasizes the importance of the design process. And she argues for a five-step process that involves defining, researching, ideating, or brainstorming, visualizing, and implementing. And we are going to be practicing and experiencing this process in the weeks ahead. So our next stop in all of this is actually going to be working with type. And that's where I'll end it for today. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.